at this stage, we have over 150,000 members among all of our meetup groups all across the world. At this point, we have also organized, promoted, and produced over 2,599 events with over 150,000 members. By any standard, by any measure, we are the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days we are 100% online. We hold an event every day of the week. Check out our schedule at idea2ipo.com. Our featured speaker today is Anita, one of the top mindset coaches in Silicon Valley, and she is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed and making the world a happier place. Ladies and gentlemen, Anita Kumari. Anita, take it away. Thank you, Jen. Thank, appreciate the introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for making the time to come and listen to us talk about your ultimate success. And thank you idea to IPO for hosting and Rob for hosting an event almost every day of the week for startup founders and entrepreneurs. And you can uh, hashtag idea to IPO success on Twitter and win some mystery prize. And before we go ahead with the main presentation, I would like to hold a poll to see where you are joining from. So I will put the poll in for around a minute and select what place you are joining from, whether it's evening, morning, night time for you. So here is the poll. And you can select other if the country of your origin is not in the poll. Usually Zoom only gives 10 options, so I have to pick out of 10. Ten more seconds. And here we are at the end of the poll. So we have 50% from the West Coast. Yoo-hoo, you made it even on St. Patrick's Day. I'm so happy. Then we have around 17% from the East Coast around 5% from the Midwest, and overall from the US is 11%. Canada is 6%, Europe is 6%. Nice, it must be nighttime for you guys. Asia, so far I don't have anyone joined yet. And then we have some from India. So here are the results of the poll. I'm myself from West Coast, so I'm very happy that lots of people from West Coast have joined and people are gradually joining even now so they might miss the poll but that's fine so i'm admitting a few more in before i go we finally got the presentation now and we will go in the presentation mode so today we are going to discuss how to master the strategies and tactics for the ultimate success. And a few housekeeping rules. If you don't want to be featured in the recording, please switch off your camera. And this meeting has been recorded. So whatever you say, or if you show your camera, then you will be recorded as well. So please make sure that to switch it off before we go ahead and I'm admitting a few more people in. Yeah, okay, great. So brief about me. So I'm Anita Kumari and as Jen already introduced me, I'm a mindset coach as well as I am a chief strategist and founder of Happiness Factors, 
a mental health startup that creates emotional wellness ecosystem, combining the holistic best of the East and West to create one of a kind solutions without using drugs, alcohol or marijuana. And we have been featured in several awards, including uh, Community Hero, we have won the Woman of Influence, we have been featured in NBC, CBS, Fox, to name a few. So what is success mean to you? What's your definition of success? You can write in the chat, what does success mean to you? When you think of success, what do you think about? Okay, looks like. So freedom, I see freedom. I see reaching my full potential. See being at peace with where I am in life, being happy in whatever I do achieving a big goal and having fun while doing it. Awesome. Being happy in whatever state I'm in. Happiness and contentment, completion. Happy, healthy, stable, making a world impact. Achieving my goal. Be full, wholly complete. These are all phenomenal answers. And I'm glad that some of you got it, all the internal aspects of success as well, apart from the external aspects, because many people think that having that uh, Ferrari or having that job or having the money in the bank, that constitutes success. But those are all external factors. And unless we feel successful inside, they really don't matter that much, right? So I would say as far as Emotional wellness is concerned, it's very important that we are in the right state of mind before we can achieve or enjoy any success. And what do I mean when I say that? What I mean is that unless emotionally we are in the right place, we won't be able to really enjoy or um, even feel good about our, uh, ourselves, no matter what kind of success we achieve. So by being emotional well, well, well I, what I mean is that you are able to handle life and its stresses in an effective and wholesome way, which is conducive to your own fulfillment and your own happiness. And that's where the happiness mindset comes in. Suppose you are going to work or having a startup or a business and something suddenly goes wrong, that valued employee left the job or your funding didn't come through or some software broke down. If you're not emotionally well, you'll immediately get into a very negative emotion of anger or fear or resentment. Whereas if you have a happy mindset, you will take a learning from that particular situation and take it um, and make sure that those same things don't get repeated again and achieve whatever goal you want to achieve. So how successful you are really depends on how well you can use your mind and your body. Said wisely, the famous Sadhguru, the mystic, the yogi, whom everyone follows, including Stanford and Tony Robbins, one of the best mindset coaches in the world, right? So think about what are you passionate about, right? If you have a business, as most of you here have, or if you are thinking about opening a startup, or even the job you are in or the life you are leading, what makes you passionate? And you can write the answers in the chat if you want to. Also, what is going well? And what is not going well? Where can you make some of the positive changes? So what are you passionate about, right? So when you think about it, there must can be many 
many things you can be passionate about. Some people are passionate about the climate. Some people are passionate about the environment. Some people are passionate about dancing. Well, others may be passionate about creating a new um, software. So everyone will have different things they might uh, be passionate about. But sometimes what you are passionate about and what company you open might not match because of the knowledge base that is lacking. Like, and I can give you an example of uh, one of my friends who's a very famous dermatologist in the Bay Area. And uh, she decided to open uh, her own business and that was a baking business. So she spent a lot of money, even put her whole house on a mortgage to borrow the money to open that bakery. But within a few months, the bakery totally failed and she lost her house and she had to go bankrupt. So what was the problem in that? The problem was that even though she loved bread and she is passionate about bread, she has zero knowledge of how a bakery is run. And without that knowledge base, she could not make it successful because she didn't have that strategy or the techniques in place in order to really make it super successful. So I would say that when you are opening your business or when you are opening a startup, it's always good to also make sure that either you have the knowledge base required or you hire someone who is an expert in that field and that way you have more chances of getting successful. And what is going well? So there must be several things in your life which are going well, whether it's your job, whether it's your health, whether it's your career, and whether it's something else, right? So whatever means a lot to you and if it is going well. So you have to take an account of it and, and see, okay, this thing is going well and this is why it's going well, right? And then there are some aspects which might not, which are, might not be that going that well, especially in the COVID times and staying indoors. Many people have put on more weight. Many people have become more and have more anxiety or they have started binge watching TV or uh, they have gotten very stressed out. So those might be some of the examples to give you an idea of uh, how to account for what is not going well. Because once you account for what's not going well, then you can decide what needs to change in order to make it more positive. Like if you have been watching TV, maybe just uh, go out and take a walk or try some yoga you know, courses from YouTube, which is totally free or do something very, very constructive. So now we are going to talk about the scarcity versus abundance mindset. And why am I talking about scarcity versus abundance mindset in a success presentation, right? You must be thinking because our mindset pretty much defines how successful or unsuccessful we are in life and in business and in our careers. So when you realize that there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you, said Lao Tzu. So many times when people are very competitive or people compare themselves with others, that's the time they get the scarcity mindset. Because what are the chances that someone else is healthier or in a better shape, more fit, has a better relationship or a better job or more money? And we can, the list goes on and on, right? And if you compare to that, you will feel the lack and you will feel bad about yourself and uh, ultimately feel underconfident and insecure. Whereas if you find things to be grateful about, you automatically get put into an abundance mindset. Because as per the universe, there is enough abundance for everyone, right? So whatever you want, it does not depend, need to depend on whatever someone else wants because whatever you want, if you put the right strategies in place, have faith beyond any shadow of doubt, then you will achieve your own goal and your own abundance. So it's very important to have an abundance mindset. By abundance mindset, what do I mean? By abundance mindset, I mean a feeling of, abundance so much that you are able to help others. You are able to be grateful for what, what you have right now, whether it's the house you live in, whether it's the job you have, whether your health or your family or anything else. You can be, some, this can be as simple as being grateful about being able to breathe today because not everyone got the opportunity to wake up today, right? Some people passed away last week, last month, last year. So, you, there are some things you can make a list of and become grateful for, and that will create an abundant mindset, as well as stop comparing yourself to others or even your business to others. Take the learning if someone is doing better than you 
and implement that learning or get them as a mentor. So that will help you achieve the abundance and ultimately achieve the success which you are trying to achieve. So effective time management. Peter Drucker, the known management guru said, one cannot rent, hire, buy, or otherwise obtain more time. And that's totally, totally true, right? Because time management is one of the least attention paid, most important thing we have in life because we can get more money, we can make more money tomorrow, we can get into a better relationship, we can get more fit, we can get more healthy, but once the time is gone, it doesn't come back. No matter whether you are the king of the world, whether you are a homeless person, the time doesn't discriminate. It treats everyone the same, pretty much. So uh, managing the time is really, really very, very important for your success. See, success is often achieved by those who don't know that failure is inevitable, said Jim Rohn, right? And I would say like in order to really achieve success, you have to really be able to manage your time well because time is money. Once it's gone, it never comes back. And uh, what happens when you don't manage time is you get overwhelmed. There are too many things in your platter and you don't know which ones to do uh, now, which ones to do later. So it would be very good to prioritize all the tasks which you have in, in your um, list and then manage them effectively. Because time management is the process of intentionally structuring your schedule to best serve whatever goals you want to achieve, whatever success you want to achieve, whatever you want to achieve in your life, whatever is your dream. And there is no right or wrong answer because for everyone, their goal is different. And for everyone, they want to achieve different things for different reasons. Someone might want to make more money to take a family on a vacation, whereas another person might want to make more money to buy a red Ferrari. So everyone has their own goals. So, but in order to really achieve those goals, we need to have effective time management. Also, in order to manage time effectively, we require strategic strategically organizing our tasks to maximize the productivity because it's very easy to be busy and not be productive. And that's one of the worst wastage of one's time, right? So good time management means organizing your time very intentionally and prioritizing activities that most efficiently advance you towards the achievement of your goals, as well as honor the values you have for yourself and your life. And you can do that by defining the goals into, or the things in your to-do list into four different categories. And number one category is urgent and immediate. And what that means is this has to be done today, right now. And if it's not done, then hell might break loose. Then you won't achieve your success. Like for example, when I'm presenting today, if I wasn't prepared with my presentation, then it would be a total failure. So. The same, this is a simple, simple example, but the same way, if you are supposed to uh, reach the airport at 4 a.m., you have to reach the airport at 4 a.m. So that's urgent and immediate. So those things which are non-negotiable and uh, which cannot be changed, so do them immediately and urgently. Then the second thing is it's urgent, but it's not immediate. So it might be something very important, like preparing the deck for your VC presentation or getting your product finalized and ready to be put in the market. So those things are equally important, but they can be done over a period of time because it's not possible to do it immediately and it's not, um, it does not require you to do it immediately. So those things you can put in the next list. Then the third list will be, the ones which are urgent, but that can be delegated. So many times, especially in the startups and smaller companies, when it gets a little bit big and people hire people, right? But because they are so used to doing all the things themselves, like for example, my, I have a startup and when I founded the startup, I worked alone for a couple of years before I built my team. Now we have five people here, but in order to, make the team effective, you have to delegate the work to them. If you still try to do everything yourself, then you will get overwhelmed and the work won't be 
done on time. So it's very important to learn how to delegate. And delegation doesn't mean that you are losing your control or your power. It just means that instead of just the success depending on your own particular output, it depends on the team's particular output. So you have to have that mindset and dele delegate effectively. Then the number four thing in your list can be something nice to have. So it's neither urgent nor immediate. And what, that, what does that mean, right? So for example, suppose you are trying to build a house. So you need the architecture, you need the foundation, you need the windows, the doors, the roof, all the floor plan, everything, right? But the extra curtains you need or the extra furniture you need, they are nice to have. So they, it's nice to go do it if you have the time and, and if you, um, your, your plate is empty, but it's not nice to do if you haven't even laid the foundation yet, because if you try to do those uh, fancy curtains, then where will you keep it? Because the house is not even ready. So basically those are the things which are nice to have, but whether you do it, whether do you don't do it, it doesn't greatly impact your success. So the four things to prioritize your tasks are urgent and immediate, urgent and can be done over a period of time, the third one was the one you can delegate. And the fourth one is the nice to have. And once you segregate your to-do list in those four, not just your workload will be less overwhelming, but you will be able to achieve a lot more in a, in a shorter amount of time because you won't be stressed out about everything on your list and your list will look nice and clean and much shorter than before, right? And the most important to learn as you uh, think to learn as you begin to practice the good time management is that being busy doesn't necessarily mean you are being productive, as I said before, right? You can be very busy without living out your priorities or without going towards your goals or without uh, being successful, right? So make sure that when you are busy, you are being productive with the busy, not busy without any business. And it's frustrating and disappointing place to be and also not a good use of your time. You are spending so much time over there. You must learn what your most important tasks are and how to prioritize them. And as the example I gave before, the four different sectors you can prioritize them in, right? And there are some techniques we could, which you can use in order to better manage your time. And some of the techniques are, maybe start your day a little bit early than you are used to after setting an intention. And after you start your day, meditate or do some physical activity before you have your breakfast and set, and when you're at work, set limits to what you will say yes to. Like don't volunteer for every opportunity that arises because if you do that, then you will be so overloaded and you won't be able to effectively manage time. And if you don't deliver, then people won't be that happy with you. So it's very, and you won't be that successful. So it's very, very important to even learn to say no. So if you have, if you think that you can only do these five things in this week, then that week don't say yes to any other thing. First finish those five before you take on something else major, right? And then give yourself some breaks and you will say, okay, I already have this much work. Why should I give myself break? And the reason for giving yourself break is to avoid the burnout. If we keep on working and working and working and we don't take breaks, then what happens is that even though we are sitting and working, we are not as productive as we will be if we took a short break in between. Maybe after you have done work for a few hours, take a 15 minute break, stretch yourself, take, um, take a walk or um, just meditate so that you, when you come back and start working again, you can be twice as productive and you can, you can achieve more in a less amount of time. Then of course, prioritize your tasks as we mentioned before. So again, I'll repeat again, because that's a good rule to follow and it's been very, very productive for me as well. So you can prioritize into four categories. One is urgent and immediate, which needs to get done today and I am by you. Second is urgent, but can be done over a period of time. Third is the one you can delegate. And fourth is nice to have. So that fourth one goes lowest on the priority list and only gets done when you have some extra time at your hands. Then make sure that you schedule your tasks and your deadlines because without a deadline, you don't know when to achieve, right? If I say, okay, I'll present, but when will I present, right? 
<laughs> I can present one year later, 10 years later, 1000 years later. So make sure you have a deadline because without a deadline, it's just a wish. Like, like there's a famous saying, a goal without a deadline, it's just your wish. So make sure you have a deadline when you want to achieve and, and also have uh, your own responsibility to achieve within that time frame. And if you don't achieve within that time frame, then have a good reason why not so that you don't get overwhelmed again, right? And also organize your workplace. And by organizing, I mean organize your files on your laptop or desktop or computer or phone or tablet, whatever you use to do your work, as well as your physical other things like your phones and your files and other things if you still use them. But uh, organizing saves you a lot of time because if I save this presentation and I don't know which folder it is in, I'll never find it, right? So it's very, very important to organize all your files and organize your workplace so that it, when you start working, you know what is where and you take all those things from that place to, to finish your work and be productive and more effective, right? And also save some time. Then also learn your patterns of productivity. And what do I mean by that when I say that? So different people have different patterns of productivity. Some people are most productive early in the morning, like one of my mentors is the CEO of Intuit. He says that his most productive hours are from four to seven before everyone is awake, right? Whereas for some others, the productivity doesn't start till noon because they um, sleep late, they wake up late and uh, after they check the emails and other stuff, then that's when they are most productive. Whereas for others, it might be the afternoon to evening and for even Another group, it can be like late night, they are the most productive because again, there are less distractions like early morning and they can just focus on what they are doing at hand. So, so find out for what is your productive time and try to do more work during that particular time because you will be able to achieve much more in a lesser amount of time in your productive hours. And everyone has their own choices and it can change over time. So it's totally up to you. There's no right or no wrong answer. What might work for one person might not work for another. So it all depends on your own lifestyle, your own um, sleeping patterns and your own productivity levels. And also use technology to help you accountable. Because sometimes if you are running from one deadline to another, one meeting to another, we lose sight of important things. And so there are lots of apps and there are lots of software which can hold you accountable. If you say, oh, I was supposed to do this much, this work, finish it by this PM, it will remind you or, or what was the most urgent things on your priority list and things like that. And focus on multi one task at a time. So multitasking has gained a lot of popularity, but if you multitask too much at one time, then you don't do a good job in any of those tasks because the brain focuses most on one task at one time to do it really well. And you will notice that if you try to do, suppose four tasks at one time, and it takes the same amount of time uh, if, uh, if you took like, did one task at one time and individually. So overall, but the quality of the task gets better when you focus on one thing at one particular time. So it's very, very important to remember that. But if you are one of those few uh, exceptional people who can excel at multitasking and do everything well, then definitely keep at it. But uh, more, for most people, uh, focusing on one task at one time works best. Like for example, if you are presenting somewhere and if you are listening to music, it might not be a very conducive thing to do, right? Or even like doing another project while going in a meeting. Like many times people work on their laptop while they are in a meeting, but then they don't hear half of the meeting. So they don't get the gist of everything that was discussed over there. So it's very, very important to focus. And of course, reinforce your good habits. Like whatever good habits have been conducive to your success in the past or make you feel good and make you feel more productive, whether it's meditation, whether it's waking up early, whether it's having a early workout or a late workout or early start of the work or late start of the work, whatever works best for your particular situation, just uh, reinforce those and you will be really able, be able to manage your time much more effectively. And I'll take all the questions after I end the presentation at eight o'clock. So we are what we repeatedly do. So excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So I see people are still joining. So, okay, let me admit them. So I would say 
in order to really excel at something or really do a great job, you have to practice again and again and again till you get a good hang of it. For example, remember when you try to learn how to drive, how many takes did it take you to really become a good driver? And now when you drive, then you don't even notice it. You start the car and you are um, pretty much driving on the freeway and you reach your uh, um, whatever destination you are going to. But uh, right now it's become so much of a habit that you don't even notice it. So we have to, whatever new things we start, we have to practice it enough so that we get that good at it that it becomes our second nature. And for that, we have to focus. So what do I mean when I say focus, right? So there is a very popular saying, which I really love, where focus goes, energy flows. And what that means is living out your priorities and achieving your goals requires a lot of focus because there are so many distractions in life. There are so many different uh, uh, kinds of information, different kinds of uh, social media or TV or uh, news and other things coming at us that it's very, very easy to get distracted. So it's very, very important to get intentional and get um, disciplined to in order to really focus. Like for example, I would say like self-control is one of the most important uh, um, habits to have in order to really focus. Like for example, you might be trying to finish a project and your friends are all going out to dancing and a happy hour and you really want to go. But if you're focused on your project, first you will finish the project before you go. Whereas if you go there and then the project gets late and then you don't achieve your success because you let yourself get distracted uh, too much. And same is true for uh, social media or, uh, or even the, I would say any of the clubhouse or Facebook uh, uh, Instagram, even emails or, uh, or your phone calls or mm, texts, because if you are totally focused on one particular project, I use, my habit is when I'm focused on doing something important, I switch off all my electronic devices and my social media, everything, so that I finish that before I'll go back to it. Because I have, uh, then that makes me much more productive and deliver much more go good work than I would otherwise if I was distracted, and then it would always get late and also my train of thought is lost. So it's very, very important to keep your focus. And in order, some people find it hard to focus because uh, they say, oh, I have ADHD or they have like some other, uh, like their attention wanders from one thing to another. It's running in a thousand different directions. So in order to really be able to focus, then you will have to train your brain. And many people don't even pay attention to training their brain even though most people do pay attention to training their body and getting those muscles and the six pack and the biceps, right? So it's very important to also train your brain. And in order to train the brain, you, there are lots of different things you can do. You can start with a meditation, you can start with picking up different habits or even like doing some games, like for 15 minutes, just drawing a doodle or playing a ball with someone else with uh, trying to focus on it or even lighting a candle and focusing on the flame, trying not to blink for uh, till you can and then uh, continuing it for uh, three to four minutes. Those all help with focus a lot. And also it, uh, getting a good night's sleep. Like many times when we get so busy with our work, with our family and other, other responsibilities we have that we forget to take enough rest and, enough, and having a decent amount of sleep, it can be seven hours, nine hours, it can be less or more depending on your particular need. But it's very important to rest our brain because once we are rest, the brain is rested enough and we have a good sleep, then we are so, so have so much energy and so much focus on the task at hand and we get tend to get much more productive than if we haven't had enough sleep and we haven't rested enough. And also make time for physical exercise because when you are doing any kind of physical exercise, whether you are lifting weights, whether you are going to a Zumba class or a kickboxing or even on a treadmill, I would say like you are focusing on achieving whatever goal you want to achieve. When you're treadmill, okay, I will do this treadmill at this speed at for whatever number of minutes, right? If you're in a Zumba class, then you'll finish till the Zumba class. And that's actually takes more coordination of the music and the movements in order to really do that. And that's a good brain exercise to do. 
as well as I would say any of the kickboxing or even like lifting weights. If you are doing it uh, like a body pump or some other weightlifting class where you have to focus on the choreography to really do those movements. Because again, in order to learn that you have to work your brain and that's how the, um, the brain gets more training, right? And I would say like, even like uh, solving puzzle or even like um, sitting someplace and not at your laptop, but some other play, uh, space uh, other than if you don't have a candle and a flame to stare at some particular point and not blinking, those are all very good brain exercises as well as uh, coconut oil uh, applied on the scalp helps a lot also to get the brain to get more healthy and more focused as well. So what does happiness got to do with technology, right? Nowadays, we have gotten so used to technology, we don't even think about when we didn't have a phone on our hands or when we didn't have a laptop, but it's very important to disengage ourselves from technology from time to time to really not let technology use us, but for us to use technology. There are many times when the technology controls you, then you are, might not be able to be that focused. You might get more moody or more despondent or more anxious because there are different things coming out from all different directions on so many different platforms in the technology. And many times people, they keep the phone on their bedside so they can't get a good night's sleep because the phone is ringing or someone is texting them or they are get on social media, then the mind starts wandering. And again, then the brain refuses to sleep. So it's very, very important to manage the technology well so that it's conducive to the health because the positive part of technology is it's made information so easily accessible. It's made uh, people take virtual visits or uh, learn from apps or uh, take different online courses. So those are all the good things. But at the same time, if people are staring at, staring at the screen the whole day, it creates uh, like there is a uh, syndrome called Zoom fatigue, which has become very popular uh, right now because everyone is having a virtual meeting. So you have to take time out and go stare at a tree or stare outside just to make sure that you remain healthy and you have the right balance. So it's very, very important to take breaks from technology and use it when needed and uh, take time to do physical exercise, interact with your loved ones or your friends, uh, go out in the nature, take a walk or even work out or do meditation. And, and during these physical activities and socializing, try to use technology as little as possible so that you can make more of the human connection because human beings are wired for human connection. And if human connection is not there, they tend to get lots of emotional issues and that hinders their path to success. So it's very, very important to manage techno technology really well as well. Because while in the positive side, it um, has uh, it makes even people addicted to the internet or addicted to the social media and then they create some persona and based on the feedback of people whom they haven't even met or the likes or dislikes or comments they tend to get into um, lots of uh, negative behavioral patterns and lots of negative triggers so very important also to remember that uh, technology is to be used as a tool and uh, everything we see on uh, different social media is not really the that particular individual or person because they might be a totally different person when you meet them in real life so it's very good um, very important to keep the human connection alive because in the negative part of the technology is diminishes the relationship and social skills especially when people when they are get together but still they're always on the phones so basically they didn't even really have a good connection or communication because even though they were met each other but they were always on their phones so they were always looking distracted and also it st stimulates health issues and it might lead to physical psychological and physical issues such as eye strain difficulty focusing on important tasks or even contribute to more serious health conditions such as depression and the overuse of technology may have a more significant impact on, on kids or teenagers but also on adults as well and um, recently a study was done where they found that uh, many of the depression cases were linked to addic addiction to internet and, and social media. So it's very important to limit them. And also it can create low self-esteem and loneliness, especially when people compare each other. And um, 
but but uh, like everything else anything in moderation is good like i'm able to be pre uh, to present to all you guys because of technology so it has a lot of good values as well if used properly like we are able to connect globally with any anyone on other part of the world but it's also equally important to take breaks from technology and have our one on one connection with other human beings and also take an account of how emotionally well we are feeling or if we need to take care of something So we are all human beings and all of us are unique and dynamic individuals. So when you work in a team, conflict is inevitable. So whether in a team or even in a relationship, it's inevitable because everyone has their own point of view from their own environment, their own thought processes, and uh, I would say their own opinions. But as Dr. Wayne Dyer said, conflict cannot survive without your participation. So when we are in a conflicting situation, and if we try to listen to the other person's point of view, and we try to understand where they are coming from and give them some compassion, some kindness, then it's much more easier to resolve the conflict than if we go on um, attack mode or if we go on, um, uh, if we don't listen to them or don't understand them and, um, and don't uh, really try to listen to their point of view. So in any situation, I would say managing conflict is one of the major skills people need in order to really be successful. Whether you uh, take funding from someone else or whether you are working for with someone else, there'll always be some situation where both viewpoints might not align. And in that situation, so it's always good to resolve conflict. The earlier, the better, because when a spark is small, it's very easy to put it out. But when it becomes a raging flame, it takes a lot of firefighters and a lot of ammunition to really put it out. So it's very important not to avoid resolving conflicts, but to uh, handle them as quickly as possible. And also they say that 10% of the conflict is due to the difference of opinion and 90% of the conflict is just due to the tone of voice. So even in the conflict, if suppose we are feeling angry or annoyed, it's very important to take an account of how impactful it will be on the other person's psyche, especially if it's going to be negative and make sure that we deliver the message in the kindest way possible. So different people use different methods to resolve conflict, right? And most people have one or more natural preferred conflict resolution strategies. So if we understand the other person's view and also understand how they like to resolve conflict, we will be able to influence them more. Because in order to influence anyone, you have to understand what influences them and then influence them. So it's very important, especially in the conflict situation too, because the other party might be feeling equally annoyed or angry with you. So, and I would say that most, and there are seven steps, which uh, and problem solving step is uh, one of them, which people use to resolve conflicts. First, we can even see, okay, wa listen, what are the things which are creating the conflict? What are the scenario, right? So why is this other person thinking about it this way? And I'm thinking about it the other way. Suppose someone says, oh, mm, the sky is blue. And the other person says, no, the sky is red. And so why is that person saying the sky is red when I see that it is blue, right? So then you have to understand where they are coming from, why they are saying the sky is red before you go into the, into the um, uh, resolution mode. Because unless you understand the whole situation, you might not be able to offer um, an effective solution to it, right? And after that, select an option or, or any, any kind of scenario which might be workable as a solution and make sure that the both parties agree on that before finalizing the solution and uh, make sure all the questions are answered from the other party as well so that later on this conflict solution does not create another conflict. And also as mentioned before, listening first is more important than speaking because once we listen, we know where the person is coming from, what are the different uh, uh, doubts they might have or different concerns they might have and then we can are more equipped to offer them concrete solutions or some options to get a solution, right? And also being impartial 
and taking the whole group or whole team into account is very important. And it's equally important to not postpone the resolution of the conflict because a conflict is usually not a very comfortable thing to resolve, but it's always good to uh, resolve it while it's still young and small. And of course, promote teamwork and broadcast praise. And by broadcast praise, I would say like praise in public, but if you have to criticize someone, criticize in private so that the person doesn't feel humiliated and that will create very good relationships. So handling setbacks. Sometimes when, whether in life or in profession or our startup or our business, some things might create setback. Like COVID has created a lot of setbacks for a lot of small businesses, especially the restaurants and uh, I would say the concert halls are one of the most impacted. So always there will be some setbacks. So we have to have enough mental muscle and enough tools at our disposal to handle setbacks so that we don't get totally broken, we don't totally get uh, um, give up and we don't totally uh, take the bad route and get into bad habits or uh, substance abuse or something like that. So Shannon Adler said, a plan B life can be just as good or better than a plan in life. And I totally agree with her because I can give you my life example. I was a high-tech executive and I wanted to be a high-tech executive till I saw all the stress and all the, um, uh, all the um, uh, depression or I would say like uh, um, burnout in the high-tech world. And uh, I was going through something in my life where I was doing all the coaching, all the neuro-linguistic programming, hypnotherapy and all other things, psychology and everything for like last 10 years. And so I decided, no, it's a, uh, it's a time I created the solution and sh uh, share it holistically and, uh, and um, uh, show people that uh, you don't necessarily just need to be dependent on, drugs to get a solution to your uh, mental health issues. So I would say, and this was, uh, was not my plan A because my plan A life was totally different, but it's, I would say it's even better than my plan A because right now I get to make a difference and uh, I get to help more people. And uh, when they say, oh, I have changed their life, that makes my whole day and it makes it totally, totally worth it. Whereas in the other plan A, I would say that, um, making a difference wasn't that prominent. So be ready with plan A, plan B, plan C. And even if you have to go with the, any of your other options or plans, don't feel bad about it because unless setbacks happen, we don't really build resilience. And unless we build resilience, we don't really appreciate the success and the good things in life. So the best way to, set, uh, to handle a setback is to learn from it and come back stronger than before. So what if you didn't win that promotion? And what if you didn't get that car? Or what if you didn't get that job? Doesn't matter. As long as you learn from it and you can get a better one, you can get a bigger one and you can uh, lead life at your terms. How you deal with setbacks and disappointments are what defines your life. They help you build your emotional muscle and and also they help you find out who your real friends really are because the fair weather ones won't stand by your side when you are going through a setback because they will think you, you might ask for help. So the ones who really care for you, they will really stick with you. And also I would say when you start living the life of your dreams, there will always be obstacles. There are doubters and mistakes and setbacks along the way. So why not be prepared for it? Because you, you know it's going to happen. So how you react to it will define the quality of your life because the quality of your emotions defines the quality of your life. So effective communication. Who hasn't heard that effective communication is one of the imp most important tools for any team success, right? And by many times when people talk about communication, they just go by language or the word spoken, but that's only a very, very small amount of your communication. The tone of your voice, the manner in which you say it, your body language, your facial expression, they all constitute effective communication. So be aware of these things apart from the words you use in order to be a really effective communicator. So good communication is a, is a 
integral part of any good relationships, whether it's at work, whether it's in a startup, whether it's in a business, doesn't matter. You need to be able to communicate effectively and clearly in order for the other person to understand you, in order, uh, order to build rapport with the other person, person or to build relationships or to build, uh, have your team like you. So it's very, very important to be an effective communicator. Because anywhere you work or any relationships you have, there will be ups and downs. But if you have a healthy communication style, that can make it easier to deal with the difficult circumstances. And also you will have more people who will stand by you because they understand you and they know you. And it builds a healthier and more stronger partnership. And also how you communicate decides how others will perceive you. Suppose I came to this presentation and I started by oh, this is a presentation on success and all. You won't even listen to me, right? Because it's insecure, it's underconfident, it's too low. So in order to really communicate well, you have to, be, you have to come across as a confident, empathetic and good communicator. And in order to do, do that, you have to notice all the different aspects of communication. Because how people perceive will be from the way you communicate. Like when I used to be very underconfident and insecure, people used to perceive me totally differently than right now as the strong woman I am today. So it's very, very important to, uh, to notice your communication and make the required changes if you need to make any. And great communication also helps build trust. And when we have a business or when we have a uh, startup, we have to build trust, not just with our customers, but also with the prospective investors, with the people who are helping us, with the other different vendors. So it's very, very important to have a style, communication style that helps build trust, gain respect, also the, have a culture or a communication style that's transparent so that people know you're not trying to manipulate them. You're just sharing the information with them, as well as it helps build rapport, clarity, and also develops your support system. And the most important of all, good communication helps you avoid any misunderstandings which you might have. So now we come to clarity and resilience. So clarity is the key to achievement while resili resilience is the foundation. In order to figure out why are you doing what you are doing, right? Why do you want to open this company? Why do you want this business? Why did you come to attend this presentation? Once you know the reason behind it, you will gain the clarity for your own life. Maybe you came here to learn. Maybe you want to open that business to help other people. Maybe you want to open that startup to make more money. It doesn't matter whatever the end goal is. As long as you are clear about what it is, it's going to help you big time towards your success and your fulfillment. And having clarity is also important because then you know that you are going in the right direction towards your goal. For example, if you are... If you want to have six pack apps and if you just take a gym membership which doesn't focus on nutrition, you are not going to get there. So it's very, very important to have the clarity. So you'll have to pick a place which offers the exercise and the training as well as the nutrition so that you get the six pack apps. So I would say like having a clarity helps you reach in the right direction when you want. For example, suppose you want to see the sunrise. If you start going west, no matter how hard you go, how fast you go, you are only going to see the sunset, not the sunrise. So you have to go to east to see the sunrise. So clarity is really important. So importance of a daily routine. And why do I say uh, a daily routine? Because life is, will keep on happening. And life sometimes will throw us curveballs. Sometimes it will be rosy and red. So we have to have our daily routine in place so that when something happens, which we are not prepared for, suppose someone you love got into an accident or someone got really sick and you, all you want to do or someone betrayed you, all you want to do is just lie down your bed and cry, but that's not going to resolve anything, right? So I would say having a daily routine will help you get, get over those setbacks and those curveballs from life much more easily than otherwise you would. Because if you have a daily routine like I do, I start with setting an intention, then do my meditation, my yoga, then cook myself a healthy breakfast and a fresh ginger tea. If you have anything like that, it doesn't have to be mine. But then even if something happens, you don't want to get up, but because you have the daily routine in place, you will go do it. And when you do that, 
then whatever bad happening happened doesn't appear as intense as otherwise it would. And also, of course, it's very important to time that, um, how much time you will spend uh, worrying or, um, or feeling bad about yourself and then just get on with the life, right? So why you celebrate every small win? See, we all set big goals, right? Like for me, uh, it is to take my company public with $100 share on NASDAQ. But if I just focus on that and don't um, acknowledge and celebrate like small wins, like filing my patent or getting some funding or getting a team together, then it will be a long time before I will ever celebrate anything. And the reason to celebrate every uh, win is it gets into your brain muscle. And once it gets into your brain muscle, the brain knows every time you achieve something, every time you achieve even a small success, it's going to get a reward. And so it will help you get even more successful. It will help you achieve even more just for the reward. So that's why it's very, very important to celebrate every small win. So now let's, now that we have discussed a lot of minor psychology, let's do some deep dive. So what can be more successful than getting a scarf, right? So the scarf model was created by David Rock. And it's a very, very important model to understand, especially for success as a team and in a company and in a job or a startup. Because see, every one of us have different things which will appear as a threat to us and different things that will appear as rewards. So when you are in a team or when you are working with someone else, it's very important to understand what is their model of threat and rewards. For example, every, most people, they like their, to have a status. They want to be acknowledged in the society. They want to have the um, uh, certainty in order to, okay, if I do this, I will reach there. If I practice enough, I will do a marathon, for example, right? Have the autonomy to be creative and make decisions. And have relatedness to the people around them and of course be treated fairly right so uh, but most people take it in a positive way like uh, if you give them status if you give them certainty but there are people who might uh, perceive it as a as a threat like if someone is trying to give them a status, they might not take it well. Or someone is trying to give them a gift, they might not take it well. So when you're interacting with that person, if you're trying to do, you think, okay, this will help me build rapport with them. That might not happen. So that's why it's very, very important to understand the, the SCARF model of social threats and rewards of different individuals so that you can work better with them and build rapport with them. And right now, I don't have the time to go into too much details about it. But if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer over email or for phone call later. So happiness effects. So what are the happiness effects? The reason I talk so much about happiness and emotional wellness is because all everything we do and everything we achieve highly depends on our mental state because without a healthy mind, you can't have a healthy body and without a healthy body and healthy mind, you can't have a healthy spirit. So all three are very, very interdependent. See, when you are in a negative state, you will be the bottom most in the ladder. You will say, oh, I won't do it. I can't do it. I don't even know how to do it, right? Whereas if you are in a, even in a normal positive mode, you will say, okay, I want to do it. Maybe I can give it a try, right? And then if you, again, don't feel secure enough, you will think, okay, how will I be able to do it? Maybe I won't be able to do it, right? And if you think more negative, you will go down the ladder again to the um, not doing mode. And if you get positive reinforcement, then you will think, okay, I'm going to try to do it. Maybe I will be able to do it, right? And the people who are really mentally well and happy, they will say, oh, yes, I did it. I achieved the success I want to, right? So success habits 101. So there are lots of uh, things which make people successful, people successful. And I would say some of them are having a daily routine, which I already talked about before. And of course, when you are at work, it's very, very important that expressing the feelings in appropriate ways. Also thinking before you act, especially if you are having a negative emotion about someone else, whether it's annoyance, whether it's anger, whether it's jealousy, whether it's something else. Because if you speak something in anger, you can't take it back and then you regret it later. And it's equally important to manage stress very effectively. 
like a little amount of stress, the fight or flight response is okay because it saves you from perceived danger, like if a mountain lion comes or some other threat comes. But if it's a chronic stress which you experience on a regular basis, then it needs to get handled so that it doesn't impact your life negatively over long periods of time. And of, of course, strive for balance between relationships, your personal life, your professional life, and take care of your physical health and of course, connect with others. So with that, for all the attendees of the success presentation today, we have some amazing deals with 50% off of all our coaching packages. And here are the details as well as on our website. And for lasting benefits, I always recommend six to 12 sessions because uh, if it's a pattern of behavior, which is uh, you have been practicing for a long time, it's not <laughs> easy to get rid of it in one session, but it's something like a presentation can be done in one or two sessions, right? And the first 10 to sign up will also receive bonus emotional wellness assessment the vegetarian recipe books and stress ass assessment valued at 350 as well. And the code to get this discount will be success. And this applies to all our coachings available on our website, happinessfactors.com. And people are as happy as they make their minds to be. So happiness is an inside job. Whether you are at zero, whether you are at 10, which is blissful, zero is totally depressed. It's always good to be somewhere between, I would say, seven to 10. Uh, 10, very few people achieve, so seven to nine, where you can handle everything life off, offers you at the same time, live your life happily and be fulfilled and not end up like Tony C or someone like that who is so successful, but no happiness inside, right? So now we are going to open up for questions. And this is a quote from my book, and this is... Uh, uh, which I published a couple of years ago, Find Your Happy, Survivor's Guide to Finding Joy in Spite of Life Challenges. So being happy does not mean that you have no issues and no problems in life. Being happy means that you are better equipped to deal with the issues and problems in life. It makes you better equipped to face challenges and make good decisions for your life. So, so because everyone likes different kinds of online social media accounts, we are on every platform. So whether you connect with us at happinessfactors.com, get a happy newsletter once a week, or you can find lots of videos on stress, on clarity, on the mental health, on wellness, on our YouTube channel. We are also on Tumblr. Our Facebook page is Happiness Factors, as well as LinkedIn and Insta. And we are still on Twitter at Happiness Faster. And Clubhouse is Happiness Factors, where we present on emotional wellness once a week at 1 p.m. PST every Monday. So questions. You can type your questions on the chat. Or oh, what is the, okay. So Dave is asking what is the length of each of the coaching sessions. It's usually 45 minutes to one hour. And Gerardo is asking, will a recording be available? Yes, a recording will be mailed to everyone who signed up for, the, uh, for this particular presentation and it will be done within one week of the presentation. So give us some time so that we can uh, send it to you. Yes, Gerardo, it started at 8 p.m. PST. Oh, how to pass your vision and motivation to others? Great question, Irfan. I would say, of course, uh, share my YouTube channel because that's where I post all my videos. And if anyone wants to get involved with the happiness uh, cause or wants to learn the coaching techniques because we do have lots of coaches on board as well. So I would be happy to talk to them. Okay, so Ram is asking, we hear and read the requirements everywhere. 
Can you share the strategies to acquire those skills? So which skills do you mean specific, Ram? Please tell me so that I can talk about it. Okay, Dave had a question about the slide, but I guess it got answered. So Stephanie, I don't really get your answer. Are you talking about the time management part? About the features and categorization? Because for more details, I think it will be available in one of the courses or the coaching part. Because this presentation includes all the different aspects in one hour. So it's more surface level to give you an idea about what needs to get done. So Sherry, you know, the chat cannot be saved. Oh, sorry, some people are saying that the slides got frozen for them, but in my screen, it was moving. So I don't know if it was the problem with your particular account. Thank you, Stephanie, and I agree with you. Starting early is really effective because that gives you more time in your day and and more uh, things to achieve and always, and in my case, I feel more fresh when I wake up earlier. Yeah, and it is right what you mentioned that we have been doing that for a long time since ancestral times. Okay, so Mina, uh, you are passionate about learning more about business. So what kind of business do you, want to learn about? Do you want to learn about uh, happiness factors? Do you want to learn about idea to IPO or do you want to learn about opening your own business? So I'm not very clear about your question. So if you could type it again, I would appreciate it. Okay, so I don't know your name, but it says DP. So you want to be more comfortable being outside your comfort zone for then, you do need some coaching or some counseling in order to really get out of your comfort zone, unless you have that much self-control if you can do it on your own, because that's one of the most difficult things for people to do because we get so used to doing things a certain way in a certain environment that even if the other uh, getting outside of the comfort zone will give us more success or more fulfillment, many people, unless they are very, very, self-developed are not willing to do do that so but it's very good that you um you want to do that because that will help you get much more successful than you are right now but you might want to explore one of our coaching packages to help you get out of the comfort zone and stick there and uh, take on risks because especially for businesses or startups i would say the success depends on how much risk you can take and how much you can go out of the comfort zone because there are always new things and unforeseen circumstances happening. I like Stephanie that impact innovation are two huge passions for you because those are really, really important for success, whether it's business or your personal life, because if you can make an impact and if you can, you, that positively influences others. And if you're innovative, you can pretty much get successful in whatever field you are because you can always find solutions, innovative solutions and be creative about it. So I think that answers all the questions, right? Unless, uh,
Thank you, Michael. Appreciate the kind word. And when I send the recording, I would always uh, also send uh, uh, some feedback questions. So would appreciate if you can, uh, guys can answer it. And since many of you join late, I'm relaunching that particular um, uh, location poll because I know that that time when I launched it in the beginning, there were very few people on board, whereas we have a lot more right now. So maybe I will relaunch it and see if people want to do it. So if you can take this uh, location questionnaire in place, where are you are joining from, highly appreciate that. And I will keep it open for one minute. Oh, my picture with Jack Canfield, the, the book is in my hand. So uh, it has Find Your Happy. So if you go to Amazon and search Find Your Happy by Anita, you will find it. Okay, so end poll. And now we have West Coast 57%, East Coast 14%, and Europe 7%. Wow, nice. Asia 7%, and India 14%. So for those who filled in Europe and Asia, can you write what country you are from? Or even East Coast, I don't know, and West Coast, because I don't know if you guys are all in. California or somewhere else. So here is the result I'm sharing with you guys. And I will leave it on for a few more seconds. Okay, so there is a question from Amitesh. How does one overcome inertia and how do you do it daily? So I would say the first thing to overcome inertia is first find out, okay, what is causing this inertia? Is it something I have in my mind, some emotion or some thought process or some fear or some anxiety? Like what is the exact cause of this inertia, right? And uh, once you find out, if you go deep inside and once you find the reason, then you can get rid of it. But also another thing which will help you get rid of the inertia will be to have a daily routine in place which you follow very, very diligently. Like at this time I, I will wake up, at this time I will do meditation or at this time I'll do yoga or whatever else you, is in your daily routine. That will help you. Apart from that, I would say asking yourself the question and ask yourself, what is making me create this inertia? Is it the fear of getting outside of my com comfort zone? Or is it some fear of something else? So once you, and also when you have this inertia, you say, how, how will it impact my life? Will it create more problems for me and not make me successful? Or will it help me go towards my success? And that will make you motivated to not have that inertia. Answered your question, unless you need a little more details. Thank you, Yang. Appreciate it.
Does anyone have any other question? We have a coach for free right now, so ask away. Thank you, Amitesh, appreciate it. And if you have any further questions, please email me or um, our number is on our website. So you can feel free to contact me or someone in my team. How, so DP has a question. How do top executives and CEOs handle day-to-day -day stress? That's a very great question. So I would say most of the top executives and uh, CEOs, like I can give you example of Jeff Wiener of LinkedIn or uh, some of the others I know. So they have a very good daily routine in place. Like I would say they wake up early enough. They uh, handle their work. And they even, many of them write journals as soon as they wake up after, just to get their strategies across. And most of them read lots of biographies and a lot of books. Many of them has have coaches which um, help them get into uh, the best mindset possible in order to do their job and, and not drop dead from all the meetings and all the um, different things they have to handle in their day-to-day -day life. and they pretty much make sure that they schedule even the me time apart from the time with their work because see, they have so many meetings, they have so much to manage and so many people want to meet them that unless they schedule the me time on their calendar, it's not going to happen. So in order to not really uh, lose out or get too stressed, so they always have some me time where they practice meditation or they have very healthy eating habits the, most of the CEOs I know, whether it's Fortune 500 or whether it's a startup, they all work out every day and they all eat healthy, meditate, uh, decide their priorities the day before or the week before and take care of uh, um, the very urgent tasks which they need to do on their own, but also delegate a lot of the work to their employees. So, okay. Uh, what is that Dave? Uh, what was, okay. So did that answer your question, DP? Because uh, these people have to manage, otherwise they won't be able to be a CEO for that long, right? Okay, thank you. So Amitesh has a question. Is reading any different from listening to audiobooks? I feel you can multitask while listening to audiobooks. See, I would say yes and no both. And the reason I would say is like, if you are uh, if you are listening to an audio book and if you are doing something else, I don't know whether you are working or are listening or answering emails or cooking or driving. See with driving, it's easy. You can multitask with audio books because that way you are listening with focus. But suppose you are answering your emails or doing some other work, then your attention will shift from the audio book to whatever, email you are responding to or reading and then you might not be able to get the whole list of the audiobook from that but i would say like but if you are driving and listening then it's a good multitasking you can totally do it or even if you are cooking or doing some other activity which does not require your brain's attention that much then it might be easy to multitask with that so for some things simple things you can multitask yeah thank you Glad you liked it. So I would say some of the, I mean, if you guys want me to also send you that uh, daily routine best practices, I'm, I'll be happy to do that. Just you have to email me in order to get it. But uh, so I would like to share some of the daily routine practices because that can pretty much make a big difference between how you achieve uh, in a day to to how much you not achieve in the sense, I mean the productivity level, not the being busy level, right? So if you have a particular uh, routine in place, for example, if you set the intention of the day when you wake up, 
So no matter what happens during the rest of the day, you will be able to handle it from a more positive aspect, from a more enthusiastic manner. And so you will be able to overcome it much more easily than if you woke up, didn't set any attention. Uh, as soon as you woke up, you started looking at the phone. Then you didn't get any time to your brain or your body to really, I would say, focus on one thing. And also another thing I would say in a good daily routine is as soon as you wake up, drink two to three glasses of warm water. And why do I say that? Because you're sleeping the whole night. So the body is getting dehydrated. And so, and if you, and also the metabolism is really slow. So if you wake up and drink two to three glasses of warm water, not just your body gets hydrated, but your nervous system also gets en energized and your metabolism goes through the roof. So whatever you eat or drink during the rest of the day, you will be able to metabolize it much more fast if you do that. And then meditating. So meditating is very important, especially in the morning, I would say, to, to focus because that helps set your focus and helps your mind relax enough that whatever else you have to do during the rest of the day, you will be able to do more, much more productively and be in a much better mood. And of course, eating plant-based live foods is equally important. And I don't say people, oh, don't eat meat, because I know many of my friends love it. But it's, I would say, balance it with greens. If you're eating meat, then balance it with greens, because any kind of uh, dead thing you eat or unhealthy thing you eat, causes inflammation. And if you have too much inflammation in the system, the system gets toxic and that creates lots of diseases, including cancer and others. So in order to not really get sick and maintain a healthy and fit body and mind, I would say whenever you are eating that um, um, unhealthy dishes, balance it with live greens like a salad or uh, green leafy vegetables or uh, so that it makes your body alkaline enough and the body won't fall sick at all. And also it's very important to eat fresh food. If you can make homemade food, it's much better. But many people eat out, but you don't know how old that food is, right? Which, which you are getting from outside or how old that coffee is, which you're drinking from outside. Because usually they say that after three hours, you should not drink the same coffee. You should make a fresh batch for yourself because it becomes more toxic. So those simple things, if you just take an account of, I would say you you will be much more healthy and much more have much more high energy. And apart from that, of course, make sure that um, you drink water. And by water, I don't mean soda or carbonated water or even like adding juice to water, or flavor to water, because when you do that, the water molecules which get too big so the cells can't absorb it. And if the cells can't absorb it, you'll get dehydrated and you will get more diseases in your body. Whereas if you drink just plain water or ionized water, the cells are able to absorb that and then they multiply much more. So your body is much more um, healthy because cells are mainly made up of water. And if the old cells need to regenerate and new cells need to be reborn they need plenty of plain water because plain water is the only molecule which is small enough for the cells to absorb so that's another good thing is okay so amitesh is asking is doing the most difficult task as the first thing okay first thing in a day i, I guess in a good practice However, if it doesn't go as planned, it reduces your level of motivation to the day and has a domino effect on other, how do you properly manage it? Okay. I would say if, if it is the most difficult task, maybe don't start your day with it because that will set the precedent for the day, right? But um, if you meditate before you start even your first most difficult task, you might be able to handle it better even if it doesn't go as planned like you mentioned because your level of motivation should not be dependent on one small task or one more one difficult task whether it's big or small but if it's if the task is very important i would say start your day right start your day with the meditation if you do prayers do your prayers set the intention that i will so set the intention i will do this task to the best of my ability i will give it my best and I won't be tied to the results. So either I'll get success in finishing the task successfully or I'll get a learning. 
So if you phrase your own verb is like that, instead of calling it, oh, I failed at that, it's not really you failed. You learned much one more way of how not to do it. Like, do you know how many times Einstein tested um, the, I think it was the bulb. If, if I'm, I listen or Einstein, I'm confusing between them, but the one who discovered the electricity, like in the bulb, he tested so many thousands of times. And then he was, he was saying that every time it didn't work, it was one more way how not to do it. So have that kind of attitude and that will uh, definitely keep your motivation up for the rest of the day. And if still, if you feel demotivated, listen to some, either go out in the nature if you have something close by and medit and uh, focus on it, how to find a solution or listen to some good calming music while you're doing that work. So, DP has a question. I heard that Zuckerberg of Facebook reads one book a week. Do you believe he actually does this? If he does, it's an important thing to do, read one book a week. See, I don't know if Zuckerberg reads one book a week or not, but I would say reading a book as often as you can is a very, very important habit. Like you must have heard about Tony Robbins. He's one of the most successful inspirational, motivational CEO whisperer in the world, right? And he used to read one book a day because he took a speed reading class. And so I would say like, uh, and that's how he accumulated all that knowledge, which he combines to offer solutions for people for with different mental issues and, and other life aspects. So I would say like reading anything as much as you can, it's really good. If you can manage one book in uh, one week, hats off to you. Or you can even have an app which will give you like 12 minute resist of the whole book because right now I was Blinkist, I think it's called. And what they do is they con um, condense the whole book in 12 minutes and it's like audio, 12 minute audio. So per book, so that way you can get more books in. But it's very, very important to keep on reading and not just fiction, but keep on reading books which will help you gain new knowledge, get new points of, points of view and learn something new. So that's very important because if we stop learning, we are dead. <laughs> See Thomas Edison, that's good. So the bulb was Thomas Edison. So I would say like anything, if and if you if and if you don't uh, succeed the first time, don't take it as a failure. Keep on, if you're really passionate about it, if you really think it's going to make a difference and if you really uh, think it's important enough, keep on trying till you find a way to do it. Because there is only learning or there is success. There's no third option. I think we are almost at the end of the time. So if you have any questions, now is the time because we are going to end in another couple of minutes. Win or learn, yes, that's what I mean. Like be successful or take the learning from it, right? And once you take the learning and next time if you really succeed, you will feel so much better about yourself and much more confident and the can-do attitude can take you anywhere you want to. So success is not just, I would say, a particular thing. As I asked in the beginning, like for different people, success is different for every individual. But in order to really have a successful life, you will have to keep on learning and keep on taking any time you... Um, run into an obstacle or a setback, keep on taking it as a learning opportunity and learn from it so that you are better equipped to handle it if it happens again. So I would say that uh, um, thinking up positively is also equally important. For example, uh, I would say like some people, they will say, oh, I have to achieve this goal. So I should not be doing this. I should not be doing that. I should not be doing ABC. And, what, and guess what happens? All those ABCs, they said they should not be doing shows up in their life. So it's very, very important to focus on the positive aspects. And I would say like, uh, 
not think of any negative words because whatever you think about, you will attract. Suppose you are going to work and you are getting late, right? Say, oh, I don't want to be late. I don't want to be late. I don't want to be late. You will hit the traffic. You will hit red lights. You will might even like be delayed due to an accident which happened further ahead. So make sure you don't say, I don't want to be late. Say, I want to be there early. And that will change the whole aspect of how you will manifest. And also I would say in order to be successful, have faith beyond a shadow of doubt that you have what it takes inside of you to achieve the success you dream, desire for your life and for your future. And with that, I would like to say thank you to all of you. And you all have my contacts. Please connect with me on uh, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Clubhouse, Instagram, whatever works for you. And I would see you guys next time. Thank you, Dave.